Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the book of Galatians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were at verse 2 of chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. Our discussions near the end of our last study centered around the good news that Paul was proclaiming among the Gentiles. And I suggested to you that that good news was centered in the faithfulness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in His death, in His burial, and in His resurrection because it was on Him that God laid the iniquity of us all. I suggested that that gospel was not that you could do something to be redeemed, but it in fact, centered itself in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We'll see it more because I believe that the great theme of this book is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. I do not believe the dominant theme is our trust in Christ, but Christ's trustworthiness. Without any doubt, our trust in Christ is based upon the trustworthiness of Christ. We'll look at that as we go on, Paul has both been sent by God and by the believers at Antioch to go up to Jerusalem and settle a question on uh, of whether redemption was totally by the finished work of Christ or whether man had some synergism in that man had to do something to ensure his being made righteous by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems apparent that if you add anything to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it isn't a finished work. And what He said on the cross wasn't true. That's the reason the Holy Spirit says to add anything to it reduces or brings the work of Christ to nothing. It doesn't make any difference what Christ did if you have to come along and do something to ensure it's truth, because then everything depends on whether or not you do what you're supposed to do. And dearly beloved, the work of Christ is reduced to no importance. What is really important, what's really important is, well, whether... Christ died in your place. It, modern Christianity says what's important is what you do and the emphasis of popular Christianity, uh, well, that's been its emphasis since day one. The reason the Holy Spirit has led Paul to pen this epistle to the Galatians, it's the very reason for writing it. And the Holy Spirit's the author. The theme of the book is Christ paid it all, that the good news is vested in the finished work of Christ his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. And that's what we've been looking at in the past weeks. Now, in the book of Acts, what Peter preached was the resurrection from the dead. So Paul laid before him that good news, which he preaches among the Gentiles. But he did it privately, to, the text says, privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or, or had run in vain. And that's, I, I think, pretty much where we were last week. The idea uh, to them who were of reputation in the English sounds as though that's a, a snide kind of a remark, as though Paul is demeaning the reputation of these leaders. And that, I do not believe, can be seen in the Greek. It's not what it says. These were actually people of reputation, and it's to them that he presented this cause and he did it in a private conference, lest by any means he should run or had run in vain. That sounds in the English as though Paul is suggesting here, or the Holy Spirit is having him suggest, that what he had been preaching was wrong. And that's not what it says. Paul dealt with a group of believers at Antioch, and he laid before them the truth of the gospel and he told them, and he, he obviously argued with them or debated with them that the leaders at Jerusalem would agree with him. 
And I think what he's talking about here is the success of his mission, not what he preaches. There's no doubt that Paul received a special revelation from God. He already told us that in chapter 1, and he's not going to depart from that uh, revelation. That's what he preaches. But what he's concerned about, I believe in verse 2, is his mission from Antioch to Jerusalem. You know, waste of time to come up and lay this before them if they don't agree with him. This mission has been a waste of time. Not what he preaches, but a waste of time in bringing this to the leaders at Jerusalem. And I have already pointed out that he knew ahead of time the people at, at Antioch had suggested that, that Paul and Barnabas would go to Jerusalem and settle once and for all. It been lovely if that had happened. Settled once and for all the question of whether or not a Jew needed to be circumcised in order to be redeemed and made righteous. And Paul had definitely preached that that was not required wasn't necessary. That's law. You know, who performs any part of the law is guilty of all, and he's under subject to the entire law, not just one part of it. So they wanted this question settled, and he went by revelation. We're told in verse 2, I doubt if Paul really wanted to go up to Jerusalem and debate this issue with the elders who were up there. And so it took a revelation from God to get him to agree with the leaders at Antioch to take this mission to Jerusalem. But he did it and he took Titus. He took Titus. The people in Antioch didn't send Titus. And without any question, Paul took Titus. I believe as a test case, Titus was a Greek, he was a Gentile, and he was uncircumcised. I don't know how Paul knew that, but Paul knew that, and Paul took him as a test case. No doubt about it. Barnabas and Paul and some others were sent from Antioch. Paul takes Titus. Paul took Titus along to see what would happen, and he immediately brings this up in verse 3. But not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And there's without question a tremendous thread of humanism that runs through modern Christianity. You know, if it isn't circumcision, which it's, it's basically it's not nowadays, it, it's a baptism or it's church membership or tithing or something else, you name it. It's something that is absolutely mandatory if you're going to go to heaven. And what's mandatory if you're going to go to heaven is did Jesus Christ die in your place? And it's that simple. It's just that simple. When we get a little bit further in this chapter, we're going to hear Paul say that they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me and the gospel of the circumcision was committed to Peter and we, when we get to that verse, the inference appears to be that we have two Gospels. You know, we have the, the Gospel of the circumcision and we have the Gospel of the uncircumcision. Now, we don't want to get tied up in a mess here. The, the word Gospel is in the Greek. It means good news. And you might as well translate it, good news. The good news to Israel is that God hath laid upon Him the iniquity of us all. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes, we are healed. That was the good news to Israel. The good news to the Gentiles is that Jesus, as you know, is... Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day from the dead. That's the good news. The good news of the kingdom is that Jesus Christ was 
victorious over death. He's going to return and establish His kingdom and rule and reign in righteousness. But all of that good news, all of it, doesn't matter when you, you, at what time you're living, is centered in the finished work of Christ. I have been criticized most of, the most in my life by stressing the importance of the finished work of Christ and the fact that the good news is there. It's, that it's, it's, there's no requirement vested in you. It was all done in Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, this is Peter preaching by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For as much as you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Okay? Now, go back to verse 1. Peter's speaking to Jews, to those who were scattered, not to Gentiles, but to scattered Jews. The vain traditions of the fathers were the works of the law, were the very thing that was being introduced to the Galatian Gentiles. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's the gospel of the circumcision. We'll look at that in more detail later on. The argument that I, I always hear is that I reduce human responsibility and redemption and I don't reduce it. Dearly beloved, I don't reduce it. I make it zero. I don't believe that the Word of God presents any requirement on the part of the human to be redeemed. I believe that you have a lot of requirements as sons of God, but no requirements to be a son. And that's why God uses the language that He did. Anybody who knows anything about birth ought to realize that it's, it's, not, it's non-synergistic. The baby doesn't say push. Peter says, who verily, who truthfully, was foreordained before the disruption of the world, but was manifest in these last times. For you now read that last verse. Who by Him believe in God? By Him. Modern Christianity says if you believe, you'll be His. And I have just shown you, Peter, in preaching to the circumcision, says you believe because of Him, not because of you. That is a clear verse on election preached by Peter to Jews. Titus wasn't compelled to be circumcised. He wasn't compelled to be put under law. But the pressure came because of, according to our text, False brethren unawares brought in. False brethren unawares brought in. Now the word false brethren there is articulated. The false brethren. So the inference from the language is that they knew who they were. You know, our deeds are manifest. I'm not so sure. I'm not, I'm not sure we're as skilled at identifying false brethren today as they were then. Dearly beloved, doesn't it make any difference to you whether you believe Jesus Christ redeemed you or whether He has to die again over and over and over again for your sins at Sunday Mass? Doesn't it matter to you that His name is blasphemed in that? And, and, and doesn't it matter that what they did to Christians hundreds of years ago, they were burned, they were torn apart, they were slaughtered, they were, they were drowned. Why did it make a difference to them and it doesn't to us? You know what? We're more understanding. We're more, we're more liberal, Steve. You know, we recognize that there are others with different beliefs who have the same rights as we have. You know, we are politically correct and doctrinally absurd. That's what we are. 
And it bothers me when my Lord is blasphemed. If you have to do anything, anything to be redeemed, then Jesus Christ didn't do enough and you have not diminished His work. You made it nothing. You made it zero. You've blasphemed His holy name. These are simple, simple biblical truths that people died for in previous generations. I've said this for around eight years. I, I, I will not bring politics into this pulpit, into a study of the Word of God. But I look at our present campaigning and it would appear as though our nation, what we'd, what we'd really prefer in a president is a man with absolutely no conviction. You know, can't have a president that's anti-Catholic. Oh, no, no. Now, believe me, folks, I, I, I know that I have many Romanists who are brothers in Christ. I have no problem with that at all. My problem is not with Roman Catholics. My problem is with Roman Catholicism because it demeans the finished work of Jesus Christ and He's my Lord and Redeemer. I have great problems with that. I'd die before I'd give in to that. Titus was pressured because of the false brethren. They knew who they were. They, they knew enough doctrine. They knew enough truth that they could identify these folks. And I believe that's why it's articulated. They were brought in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. You know, they had to find out somehow whether Titus was circumcised or not. In the language is that blunt. You know, I can't help but wonder what a rabbi said a woman had to do to be redeemed. You know, and it's that foolish. You know, we don't split churches over the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You know, we split them over, you know, how you baptize, whether you baptize, how you baptize, how you become a Christian. I don't know how they spied out our liberty which we have in Christ, as the text says, but, but there were some who thought that they could sneak these brethren into the assembly, and guess what? It didn't work. And that's why the definite article is there. They were immediately apparent. They knew who they were and they came in to spy out our liberty. That is to reduce the liberty that we have in Christ. Now we have a tremendous problem. You know, because it's the, it's the liberty of the Christian that always causes concern, always causes the problem, always causes the confusion. Galatians 4.29 but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Okay, I, I jumped ahead a bit. I, imagine, folks, you were promised to God before you were ever born. Isaac was promised to Abraham and Sarah before he was ever born. Years before he was born. You were promised to Christ before the disruption of the world. And there is no power, none, no power in heaven or earth that could defeat the promises of God. But what is this liberty in Christ? Well, I don't believe you're under law. The law was not made for a righteous man and that's what you are. Why does it say that in Timothy? It clearly says that because you have been made righteous. You have that in Romans chapter 5. You have that in 1 Corinthians. God made you righteous in Christ, for it is God who said, I won't call evil good and I won't call good evil, and woe to the man that does so. God can't call you righteous unless He made you righteous. There's that slippery form of Christianity that says, you know, what God does is, well, He looks at you. He knows you're not righteous, but He calls you righteous anyway. And folks, that will look, 
look at what that mean, it would mean. That, that would mean that God lied, okay? He calls you righteous because He made you righteous. The liberty that's spoken of here should not be construed as, well, I can do anything I want to do. You know, that's, the, that's the accusation. I'm absolutely positive that every single one of you sins more than he wants to. But because you have a new creation that is absolutely righteous, that, that's offended by the things that the old creation does. But the liberty here is freedom from any regulation or requirement to be a member of the family and the household of God. Is there a difference between the way God looks at a murderer? You know, you know, one murderer is the child of the devil, another murderer is the child of God. Is there a difference? Absolutely. The sin of the child of God is placed on Christ. Now that doesn't mean that, well, since, uh, since the sin is placed on Christ, then you know, we're, we're not immune from the effects of sin. doesn't mean that. But the central theme of the liberty here in this context is that you are free from any requirement of the law for redemption. Those of you who have been raised with Christ, why are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not? And in Colossians, the context there is your redemption in Christ. You are not redeemed because you go to church. You are not redeemed in this particular context because you're circumcised. Neither are you unredeemed if you're uncircumcised. That's your liberty. In Christ, you have absolute freedom from any requirement for redemption, any requirement of the law. And that doesn't just include your redemption, but your walk. If you didn't trust the finished work of Christ, what are you going... I, I should ask, who are you going to trust? You see, all of your concentration is going to be someplace else. The grand thrust of that truth will come up shortly. There are those who are focused on Christ and those who are focused on themselves. It's just that simple. Verse 19, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Now, that ought to be clear to anybody that reads it. If there's some requirement for you to be redeemed, that's what you're going to live unto. You can't spend your time concentrating on Christ and on setting your affections on Him and on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you're going to have to spend your time on whatever that particular responsibility is. And you can't live unto God. And folks, that is a sobering thought. We have died to those kinds of requirements. It's impossible for you to live unto God in the flesh, law-keeping as a rule of life. Now, what, what would we say today? Well, you know, come on, Titus, be circumcised. You know, I mean, it's just a small thing. I'll have you know, Titus, I just want to tell you straight from the shoulder, hundreds and of thousands of men have been circumcised and they lived. You know, you can make it, kid. You know, and why not? Why would you offend these people? You know, they're, they're serious, they're hardworking, they're desperately committed to their convictions. Let's don't bring division into this fellowship, you know. That's what we, that's, it's what we do today. It's such a simple thing. It's just a tiny thing, and yet it's just it's a whole lot. And many and many a man has gone through it. You know, after all, water baptism isn't much. You know, if you need to be water baptized to be redeemed, it's not, that's not that big a deal, is it? Somebody really believes that. Well, okay, let's don't fight with them. Let's, let's have peace in the fellowship. Doctrine doesn't mean anything today. Oh, Timothy, take heed unto doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And we have Christianity today by 
Christians by the millions. They're just in sermons. They're just little sermonettes, you know, so that you can so that you can all be inspired to just go out and do something awesome for Jesus today. Not important whether or not he's circumcised. It's, it's important enough here that Paul is going to break fellowship with these people if Titus is compelled to be circumcised. But thank God he wasn't. He wasn't. To whom we gave place by subjection. Nothing, no place, nothing for a moment in order that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Listen to that purpose clause. It isn't anything to be circumcised. That's no great problem for Titus. And it, you know, it would have stopped all of this disruption. What a simple thing to do. But folks, it would have destroyed the truth of the gospel itself. That's what's important. That's desperately important. It's not important today. What's important today is to get along somehow with everybody. Everybody just get along. John 17, Lord, my prayer is that they be one as we are one. And they, they look around and they say, well, they say it isn't one. We got Baptists, we got Pentecostals, we, you know, we, got, we got Calvinists and Arminians, and we got Jehovah's Witnesses, and we got Roman Catholics, and, and on and on and on it goes. And we're not one, so let's work for oneness. Got to have these big conferences. And listen to me, folks. What happens when you say that? The first thing you've said is that Christ's prayer wasn't answered. If Christ's prayer was not answered, well, then He sinned. For we clearly know that if He asked anything in the Father's will, the Father, the Father would do it. So if the Father didn't do it, then it wasn't asked in the Father's will, and that's sin. And therefore, Christ is not a perfect Redeemer. And therefore, I'm not redeemed. And the entire, the entire gospel evaporates over one little statement that Christ prayed something that hasn't happened. And I'm telling you that we are one in Christ. We're not striving to be one. We are one in Christ. You who by Him do believe. And the fact that you may have different convictions, so serious that we split fellowship, makes no difference in the prayer of Christ. The oneness that He speaks of is the oneness of the gift from the Father to the Son. We look on the outward. you know, He looks on the inward. Without any doubt, His prayer is answered. Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. Absolutely. And to go around and preach to Christians that that prayer isn't answered and, and we, somehow we ought to work to answer it and to heck with doctrine destroys the truth of the very Gospel that we proclaim. You know, I was asked to preach in Albuquerque, New Mexico years ago and I... I and, uh, you know, I preached as I preach here. And then the minister got up and said, I want to give an invitation. So he did. And the invitation is a, an invention of the last couple of generations. But he gave one. Some guy came down, had a pack of cigarettes in his shirt pocket. And this uh, minister went down and said, well, if you want to be saved, you've got to get rid of those cigarettes. And I had the guy sit down and I said, I said, now, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, that's a, that's a terrible thing to do in somebody else's church. But folks, that destroys the truth of the Gospel. If you can't go to heaven until you get rid of cigarettes, then it's not Christianity. It's, it's something other than. It's something else. It's something sinister. You're going to be the pawns of collectivism, folks. That is, that's terrible, but it's going to come. If the Lord tarries, that's, that's what we're looking at. There's no doubt about it. You see, the emphasis is not on Titus' circumcision. That's a simple little thing. But that, 
what I'm trying to impress upon you is that it's that little tiny thing. Just that tiny thing would destroy the truth of the gospel. And it's destroyed in sermon after sermon around this world today. Let me repeat the good news. Jesus Christ died for your sins and He was buried, which means that they were carried away. And on the third day, He rose from the dead, which says that the price that He paid is an absolute sufficient price. Nothing more needs to be paid. You have been made righteous. That's good news. Don't let a silly little inconsequential thing like circumcision destroy the truth of the Gospel. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Your Word, for the privilege and the opportunity that we've had to think about it. Oh, how marvelous that You have made us righteous in Christ. May this truth grip our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.